Freud's last session. Uh, so apparently C.S. Lewis attempted to get a meeting with Freud to have a conversation before he died. Uh, we don't have record that that meeting actually happened. Uh, a, a playwright, Mark St. Germain, a very, uh, very good, very smart playwright, um, who, who also he wrote the play The Question of God, uh, which some of you might be familiar with, said, well, what, happened, what would have happened? So we have a play this summer on C.S. Lewis versus Sigmund Freud uh, in Freud's last session. Uh, so very exciting for us. And what we're going to do, um, I just talked with the theater people this morning, uh, for our next C.S. Lewis so Society session in April, I'm going to schedule the theater department to come in to talk about the play, maybe uh, read a scene from it and just talk about what the ideas are um, behind it, some of the some of the dramaturgy behind it. So, <laughs> Margie's having. And Margie just found out. She we're just found out we're having. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, Margie will take care of all the details. <laughs> if you have any questions she has nothing at all, to do. go to Margie, ask her. <laughs> yeah, give us a few days to get this one organized, <laughs> but we'll get it there. Anyway, so so glad to see you here today. Um, Many of you weren't here last time, and Dr. Brown presented, and at the end of that presentation, we, he opened it up for discussion, and we began what I thought was a wonderful and exciting discussion that I had hoped would be happening on campus years ago, and it, is, it has to do with the arts, and what role do we, as artists, and I really consider everyone that, that comes to my classes, at least, an artist. Uh, in, in various forms, what, wh how do we communicate Christ through our art? And what are the limits? And what are the strengths? And what are the challenges meeting us today? And so that discussion kind of bled over into that, and I just thought we would continue that. And so I've invited uh, three reputable men, questionable men, uh, <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we say it's no country for old men, right? So, but here we are. And uh, <laughs> to, to help in this um, discussion. So the way we're going to run this is that we're going to each make an opening statement. And then after that, we'll have a little bit of dialogue between ourselves, and then we'll open it up for you. And together, we'll begin to ask some of these questions and wrestle with it. Will we answer them all? No, of course not. But we'll begin a dialogue that I hope continues in the hallways and classrooms in our homes, um, in, in just in, in every environment that we, that we find ourselves in. Now, um, I have a little thing here called uh, Artistic Orthodoxy, or God-Breathed Imagination. I handed out to some of you. I wrote this years ago. But I just thought it sort of was a good introduction to what we're trying to do today. It doesn't mention Lewis so much, but it does mention the arts and film and, and writing and those kinds of things. And so it just is an introduction. If you don't have it, don't worry. On the uh, second page of this, I have one of my favorite Lewis quotes. And if we have time, we might be able to unpack that uh, from experiment and criticism. So let me just begin by, um, by saying this. Uh, three years ago, um, uh, Paul Eli, anybody familiar with Paul Eli, a book he wrote, Your Life, A Life You Save May Be Your Own, taking that phrase from Flannery O'Connor. But in, he was asked to um, report in the New York Times uh, on the book review section about how Christian belief figures into literary fiction in our place and time. And he said, jokingly, somewhere between a dead language and a hangover. And what he was saying there is that, but if any patch of culture is said to be post-Christian, he says it's literature. Half a century after Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy, uh, Reynolds Price, and John Updike presented themselves as novelists with what Flannery O'Connor calls Christian convictions, their would-be successors are thin on the ground. So our works of fiction, uh, fiction about the quandaries of Christian belief. Writers who do draw upon the sacred text and themes find their references gone unrecognized. A faith that something like over 170 million uh, adherents in the United States, a faith that for centuries seeped into every nook and cranny of our society now plays a much lesser role. The obvious answer to what is going on here 
and what is, where has belief gone is that it, in America today, Christianity is highly visible in public life, but marginalized or of no consequence to a great many American lives. So in our personal life, it's, it's, it's marginalized in how we make our everyday honest decisions. At least that's what he argues. For the first time in our history, it is possible to speak of Christian Christianity, matter of fact, as one religion among many. For the first time, it is possible to leave it out of the conversation altogether. He actually gets this argument, I believe, from uh, Charles Taylor, if you're familiar with him, and his wonderful book, uh, Secular Age. I recommend it to you. It's like this thick. Um, but, you know, thick books are good, too. Uh, <laughs> if you want the short version of it, Jamie Smith, if you're familiar with him, has written uh, a thinner book <laughs> that explains everything that Charles Taylor is saying there. But Charles Taylor is one of those giants um, in, in, in our area that speaks to us. Um, so, half a century ago, Flannery O'Connor framed the struggle that we face as Christian artists is to make belief believable as a struggle for the attention for indifferent readers, viewers, listeners. The religious aspect in a work of fiction, she insists, is a dimension added, not one taken away. And she explains how she, uh, that she said to the Hard of hearing, you need to shout. And to those almost blind, you need to draw large pictures. Today, the United States is a vast Home Depot of do-it-yourself religion. But, it won't, um, but you wouldn't know it from the stories we tell. The religious encounters of the kind C.S. Lewis and Flannery O'Connor described forces us to take a personal look at our beliefs and how they figure into our own lives. How we decide just what is true for us and what is worth acting upon. I consider this question absolutely fundamental for not only the school, but for the church. If we do not take back the arts. If we do not find ways of communicating through dance, drama, theater, literature, we will lose this next generation. So in my opinion, and this is only mine, these other men can all maybe disagree with me, but we have a very large topic to talk about. And so three great experts, we're going to start with Andrew Quick, and I've asked each one of them to, I sent them a little material, and I just asked each one of them to comment on C.S. Lewis and the arts. Andrew? Thank you. What do the arts have to do with Christian witness? I looked at this question, and I didn't like it very much, because I think what he's really implying, my good friend uh, Dr. Fraser, is how do we witness through the arts? How do we use it? How do we propagandize our faith through the arts? And I am against that because art and propaganda are not the same. Uh, and so this is a crucial subject that we need to discuss. Is it the wrong question? The idea that the arts have to do Christian witness, which I think he implies, but he didn't state, is repugnant to me. It reminds me of the good Kendrick brothers down at Sherwood Baptist Church, whose every film is a kind of visual sermon on failed marriages, fireproof, bad fatherhood, courageous, prayer warriors, war room. They're trying so hard. Um, but it's not getting anywhere. Uh, does bad art help the spread of our faith? I'm not sure it does. Uh, except, except anything which causes us to think seriously about the human condition may bring us closer to the reality of Jesus Christ. What the Kendricks are doing is preaching cinematic sermons. Uh, now to preach a sermon you need a spell at a theological college, and that'll help to get your theology in the mainstream. What a, what a Department of Film and Television might do, might be like this one, is to make you a better Christian communicator. The Kendricks turned their back on the academy. 
they chose neither a theological college uh, nor a film school uh, to equip them to be better communicators. And believe me, they're bad. Of course, some Christians will leap, leap to their feet and tell me that, well, the last one made 60 million. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it's nice for the church. Uh, but making money is no guarantee for excellence. Um, God bless them, they're serving the kingdom with their own special way. But, but, are they helping the cause of imaginative apologetics and the arts? What did C.S. Lewis write? What he wrote, what he said, what we want is not more little books, oh, little films about Christianity, but more little books by Christians and maybe Christian and films on other subjects with the Christianity latent, not necessarily explicit. What about reality? We do not retreat from reality, we discover it. Lewis wrote, as long as the story lingers in our mind, by dipping them in myth, we can see them more clearly. And there's a huge discussion about myths, so I don't want to get into that. The Narnia books, the Lord of the Rings series by J.L. Tolkien, are both examples of artistic myths by which we can see the world more clearly. In researching this topic, I came across Boxen, the imaginary world of the young C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis didn't start writing books for children in order for them to become Christians. At the age of eight years old, his two great literary pressures were dressed animals and knights in armor. He created a place called Animal Land, and his brother, Warren, invented India. The, the two nations were eventually united in the single state of Boxen, ruled by a Raja and a rabbit. During their childhood years, the two brothers chronicled the history of Boxen from the 11th century to the coronation of King Hawke V and Benjamin VII. It's all wonderful imagination. Is it evangelistic? Not primarily, no. He did it because it was an outflooring of the extraordinary creative gifts with which he was provided. Is it art or is it childish nonsense? Lewis was essentially a creative person from his birth onwards. His creativity bubbled out of him. And so because he was a Christian, his beliefs bubbled out of him too. In his space fiction novels, in his poems, in his autobiography, his faith bubbles out. But he did accept there was a role for Christian apologetics, which is not exactly Christian evangelism, but it's explaining the Christian faith in an unbelieving world. So Lewis wrote numerous books about Christian apologetics. One of his best is The Four Loves, you may have read it. Reflections in the Psalms is good. And of course, as a professor, he wrote many books of literary criticism books of fact, not fiction. Now, literature offers us a different way of seeing things, as does film. He wrote, my own eyes are not, en not enough for me. I will see th through those of others. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men, and I remain myself. To see with other eyes, to imagine with other imaginations, to feel with other hearts, as well as our own. There's a wonderful word by Plato called psychagogia. Lewis insists on texts challenging it. Reading works of literature is about f entering fully into the opinions and also the attitudes, feelings, and total experience of other people. That's what Plato, uh, Plato calls psychagogia, an enlargement of the soul. And that's what true art can do for each one of us. Will that help our beliefs? Perhaps. Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, we're just going to kind of continue, I think, off of uh, Andrew's. Um, kind of looking to the other side, though, of uh, the question of, um, uh, the, qu the question comes up, can, can evangelism use film? Can evangelism use, and, and that's, uh, that's not an approach I want to take, but I will, I will say this, I do think that the gospel does require story. Uh, it, I, I don't think you can give gospel in just a, uh, a sermon or a lecture. I think story um, is necessary. Um, and I want to start not, not necessarily story about religion. Um, and Andrew's quote, the quote he took from Lewis, uh, I'm going to repeat. Uh, what we want is not more little books or little films or little TV shows about Christianity, but more little books, films, TV shows, plays uh, uh, by Christians on other subjects with their Christianity latent. 
Um, so I think some of, some of the best uh, work about Christianity is going on today in non-religious uh, worlds. So if you wanna see what the world of the, of the uh, New York Police Department looks like through the eyes of a Christian, then you should be watching Blue Bloods. Uh, if you wanna see what does the White House look like through the eyes of a Christian, uh, you should be watching Madam Secretary. Um, those are things that are being written by Christians with Christian characters within them. They're not about Christianity. It's not about um, Jesus. It's not about, um, you know, can Madam Secretary say, uh, you know, bring the president to Jesus. Um, but it's about how can we get some Christian ideas into those conversations. Um, so why do, I, why do I say that the gospel needs uh, story? Um, uh, because first off, you can, the, the gospel can only partially be understood. Intellectually, you can only partially understand the gospel. As Paul says, he's, you know, now I look as if through a glass darkly. It's not until we get to heaven that we're gonna fully understand the gospel story. Um, instead, the gospel must be experienced. It's an experience, not just an intellectual argument. Um, David McFasden uh, says, as Christians, we are good at making the word, word. We need to make the word flesh. We need, to make, we need to make Jesus not an intellectual, something that's reduced to intellectual, but something that is intellectual and emotional and uh, spiritual, something that can be felt. Um, uh, Bobette Buster, uh, who is a, um, a film uh, uh, a script uh, a doctor, um, says, if your film gives a message, you've missed what the medium does well. So she isn't saying that a film shouldn't give a message. She says, if your film does give a message, you've missed the point of what film does best. Um, you've missed what the medium does well. It gives the experience of redemption. Um, if, you're, if you do a movie and your audience walks out saying, oh, now I can explain to people what redemption means, then you've, you've missed the point of what film does. If they walk out and they go, now I understand what it feels like to be redeemed, now you've brought them closer. Um, so I think, too, the, that... Uh, the, the fullness of truth um, often comes through story. Story is one of the things that helps you get to the fullness of truth. Uh, Madeline Langle said, we all want truth, the truth which Jesus promised would make us free. But where do we find it? How could it have happened that even in the church, story has been lost as a vehicle for truth? Early in our corruption, we are taught that fiction is not true. Um, I also think that story helps reflect God uh, in a way that we can't get to in just a sermon. Um, Flannery O'Connor in Mystery and Manor says this, yet what is good in itself glorifies God because it reflects God. The artist has his hands full and does his duty if he attends to his art. He can safely leave evangelizing to the evangelist. Um, and uh, lastly, I'll say that the thing that story also brings uh, to trying to spread the gospel, to trying to explain the gospel, to try to get people to experience the gospel, is that story speaks in a different language. Um, it speaks in a spirit language. Um, so a good story isn't just English from the page to the English translator in our brain, but a good story is actually a soul language from the page that is talking to our soul in a ways that we necessar can't necessarily um, articulate. Um, uh, Ken Geyer in Windows of the Soul, um, in talking about movies that he's watched that have just um, uh, uh, transformed him through the watching of, he says, when we see such stories with all their hardships, colors and juices that moves us in ways that principles and prohibitions can't. They move us not by external forces, but by internal ones, not by law, but by grace, by the quickening of our conscience and the stirring of our hearts. Um, and then I'm uh, just going to wrap up my comments by, by uh, pointing out that there is, a, there is an argument that can be made by beauty that can't be made uh, by the intellect. Uh, Thornton Wilder, playwright, uh, in his foreword to The Angel That Troubled the Waters says, didacticism is an attempt at the coercion of another's free mind, <coughs> even though one knows that in these matters beyond logic, beauty is the only persuasion. Uh, so I think the gospel is something that goes beyond logic. It is logical, sure, but it goes beyond logic. Uh, and when you're in the area that goes beyond logic, Beauty is the only language uh, that, that can speak to it. That's all I have to say. How about you, Gil? Do you have anything to say? Dr. Elkin. Good. Um, I'm a playwright. 
uh, a director, uh, something of an actor when I can remember my lines. <laughs> and um, uh, several years ago I wrote an article about um, how then shall we write, which is sort of a takeoff on Francis Schaeffer. And at that time um, I struggled with well, what are the main ideas, concepts, uh, modalities that a, um, a Christian writer has to think about as he uh, approaches um, his or her work and as you put your work out there to not only to um, a Christian culture but to a dominant culture. And I don't say that I have all the answers but I came up with a few of the elements that I think we have to think about and which C.S. Lewis throughout his life uh, so nicely um, articulated in a much better uh, sense perhaps than I can. So what I'm putting out to you there is what we're struggling with. Uh, I think in many ways uh, the generation before me, my generation, yeah, his generation, <laughs> um, are making progress from the standpoint of um, putting together this magnificent faith structure and somehow communicating it through story. But it's you guys who have to take these elements and these struggles and these images and these ideas and really make them sing. Because in some ways we haven't done that good a job. That's why we're all here. And so the joy I get from just seeing a good line, a good gesture, a good moment from my brothers and sisters makes me happy. The first uh, concept is the idea of sin. I think that we live in a, in a culture today that denies the idea and the source of what sin is. And one of our great challenges as a writer is how we, um, you know, without being didactic, without being moralistic, how we communicate sin in the world as sin, which is essentially separation from God. That's a test. That's a test. When we pass the test, we no longer sound like a bumper sticker on a car. The second one is the idea of destiny. Each one of us here is hopefully written down in the book of life, right? Each one of us here, even though we struggle and we wonder why, where it's come from, where we're going, God is taking us in a direction and we get off the road and we get back on it. But the longer you live, right Andrew? The longer you live, the more you realize the pattern and the destiny that God is working out for you. I'm, particular, uh, I'm particularly enamored of films and of plays that have that overview, the sense that there's something more in life that is pushing us through it than just existential happenstance. Another one is um, the idea of character. As Christian writers, uh, I mean, uh, the culture oftentimes says, oh, your character is formed by the age of five, and everything you do after that is pretty well categorized and in um, in line with all of those DNA kind of things like that. Do we believe that? Do we believe that it's possible for a character or a person to radically change in their lives? How many people think we do? Right. I do. And to write that is our greatest challenge to take us through that so we believe it as human beings, we believe it as people who are failures, we believe it as not just some sort of a wild, light-filled, huge orchestra, angel singing, transcendental moment, but a moment like Flannery uh, O'Connor gives us, which is embedded in life and embedded in who we are and embedded in the very search that we're all looking for. How we define that search 
and how we project it and how we show this change, I think that's the breaking point. That's the point when we look at film and we say, ah, okay, right? That's why a good colleague of mine just wrote a book on prayer. Did, were you, that wasn't the one that you were on. Prayer in films. How, you know, Terry, Terry Lindvall. And, and how, how that's projected. Um, and this leads right into the idea of the objective cor correlative, which T.S. Eliot talks about. And, and uh, it sort of epitomizes uh, Hopkins' poetry. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. And that means that we find God and his existence in this, you know, in the words I'm saying, in the air we breathe, in the mountains we see, in the, uh, the, the slums that we walk through, God is there and it's charged, and it's our job to be able to find and locate and to bring up and to make a horizon of this material world that we live in. So those are all things that uh, challenge me. Finally, I believe very much within this last statement that Christ is in culture, as Nubara would say. And um, uh, I think one of the reasons why I love the theater so much, and I love, I love film too, is that um, it talks about uh, something that uh, C.S. Um, Lewis talks about here, and I can't, uh, uh, oh yeah, um, we do not retreat from reality, we rediscover it. As long as the story lingers in our mind, the real things are more themselves. By dipping them in myth, we see them more clearly. Well, what's C.S. Lewis talking about? He says here that we do not retreat from reality. That means stories are not psychological crutches. They're not escape me mechanisms. They can be. But if we are creating art that challenges, art that exposes, art that reveals, art that transforms, then we're doing, I think, what C.S. Lewis is talking about. We're bringing art back to reality, but reality isn't everything we see and everything we can make a noise out and everything we smell. No. Reality is the imagination of our minds. So when, when he talks about myth, and C.S. Lewis writes a lot about myth, and his writings are about myth, who is the fulfillment of the whole mythic process? Christ. Christ lives the whole mythic journey. C.S. Uh, I mean Nietzsche talks about, and thus spake Zarathustra, scrambling in the roots of our culture to try to find our mythic roots. Hey, Nietzsche, you only have to look to Jesus to find the archetypal patterns for us as individuals, for us as a culture. And that's when the stories, when we can find that in the stories, we will have done something, something great. And C.S. Lewis constantly inspires us along those lines. Thank you. You know, if I could just comment, and you, the rest of you feel free to do so, but I'll, I'll start out because I'm in charge. <laughs> uh, one of the things, uh, the first thing you said is sin. And Flannery O'Connor, by the way, she is, in my mind, the very best workbook you could, if you want to be an artist, Read Mystery of Manners. A couple of you mentioned that. It is profound because so many artists just do their art and you kind of wonder how that happened. But she not only could do art, but she could reflect on what she was doing. And she happened to be an amazing Christian woman. Uh, but she said the very first thing that an artist with Christian convictions does is takes sin seriously. And I think one of the things that might differentiate between an artist who is a Christian and an artist who is not a Christian is that they don't take sin seriously. I think a oftentimes we, we want the whole thing. We try to do too much in a story or in a film. You know, we take them from learning about God to on their knees and beyond. And what maybe just one step at a time. And that's what I see happening in her books. And you can miss, she said, every one of her stories, every one, 
is an offer of grace to those that aren't expecting it or to those who resist it. So she was very clear on who her audience was. It wasn't you and me, although we could do well to learn from her, but it was those that were the sleepy, lazy reader who did not want to really believe, who didn't really believe in fact or value. Um, the other thing I uh, thought you, you said, um, Gil, was the idea of how important change is, and immediately I go to one of my favorite books, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, and how that one character at the very end just keeps his, his uh, keep saying, uh, what was it, the, the thing about death and that, the, I am the resurrection and the life, and how at the very end of his life, he's lived his whole life in, in, in just for himself, and at the very end, so it, it, what a beautiful, powerful story. Now, you don't get the four spiritual laws in that story, but that story haunts me. That character haunts me. And what haunts me about it is that change in that character, because he was so consistently bad, and then at that last moment, he was so, um, you know, and I kind of wonder, could I do that? Talk about transportation or, or uh, identifying with somebody. Wow. Um, then the last thing I would say uh, with what you said about that search, that search Lewis called, as we all know, longing. And so there's that longing. So what you were saying also has uh, a, a, a strong connection with Lewis, sometimes joy or longing, that longing for something else. Anyway, those are just my thoughts uh, on, on what you had yeah, to say. What's the German word he used for that? Oh. Longing, remember? I don't remember. Hmm? Yeah, I'm not going to try to say that. <laughs> My mother well, if you German. look up a dissertation that was written here by Tim Wright, his oh, yeah. whole dissertation is on the idea of yeah. longing in, in, in uh, C.S. Lewis and in culture in general. I want to uh, pick up on your comments, on his comments on sin, uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, how uh, O'Connor tells us that the first thing we have to do is take it seriously. Um, and, I th and I think there's two sides to that. One is the, you know, the kind of the secular side of, well, sin doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, what, what, what matters is today, what matters is now. Um, and I think the other side of it, the, the, the way that uh, Christians don't take sin seriously in their fiction, is they, they uh, confuse sin, or they, they, ba they say that they simplify sin. They say, well, sin is a, sim is a set of rules. So I'm, I'm going to explore the sin of, of uh, adultery. And, well, adultery, the Bible says adultery is wrong, so adultery is wrong, so don't do it. <laughs> All right, there we go, right? As opposed to, well, it, it's not a list of rules. It's not about, um, uh, it, it's, it, it goes something deeper. It's like, well, sin is, sin is a sickness. Sin is something that damages. Sin is something, it's not just, oh, you, you, you didn't do what Daddy said to do. Um, there, there's more to it. I think, uh, I'm reminded, uh, Dave McFadden tells a, a wonderful story, and I'm not going to tell the whole thing, but uh, about a, a young Christian um, actress who came to him for advice because she was in an acting class, um, and they wanted her to say the F word. Um, and she broke down because she couldn't say it, and so she came to him crying, saying, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And he says, well, why won't you say it? Well, it's a, wrong, it's a bad word. Well, why is it a bad word? She's like, uh, that's a stupid question. Everybody knows it's, a, it's on the list of bad words. That's why. And he said, until you understand why that word is a damaging word, you don't understand what that sin uh, really is. Yeah. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, the, the, what, what does the word mean? Uh, well, it means to have sex, right? To procreate taking something that God ordained as something beautiful. Well, how do we use it? When you say F you to somebody, you're saying, oh, you are so beautiful, I would like to procreate with you. No, you're saying kill you. Oh, so we're taking the word that is the substitute for creation of life, and we're using it to say kill, right? We have subverted nature by how we use that. That's why it's a bad word, not because it's on a list. Um, so I think, I think that's part of what we, our obligation is, as Christians who are artists, is when we're dealing with topics like sin, is to take it seriously. And not just to say, well, we all know as Christians we're supposed to vote according to a certain party. Well, that's not, that's not what Christianity is. Christianity, well, why would you vote that way? Why would you take that? Well, as Christians, we all agree that we do this. Well, why do we agree to do this? What, what is it under that? that yeah, that's right. Um, we're, God is much less of a prude than many of us are. Um, the, I knew a, a, a woman who was um, uh, quite a musical theater actress in uh, New York and um, strong Christian lady. 
And her schedule was full. Her agent came up to her and said, look, uh, down at this big playhouse in Miami, uh, they want you to come down there and play Irma La Douce. Well, Irma La Douce is it's a fun musical, but Irma is the head of a whorehouse. So she's, she doesn't want to do it because of her faith. And so she says, well, I've got three things blocking it. There's, it's not possible at all. If those things, three things disappear in two weeks, I'll go do it. They disappeared. She went down there, played the role, did a wonderful job, and did what? Had an unbelievably transforming impact on several members of the cast. Mm -hmm. So God is oftentimes looking. Uh, he, you never know how your art will be used. And sometimes we, we put up these, again, bumper sticker kind of definitions which keep us from really engaging that culture out there. Andrew. <laughs> this is Andy Friedman, our most recent professor. He's our youngest professor. somehow want to reveal that you're not a deity, that sin is an existing thing, and, and that in dealing or wrestling with that, there's need of something more, that longing that uh, you were talking about, Tim Wright discussed. And, and I guess the, the image may or may not work, but the question would be, when you see a Kendrick film, and I'm with you, Andrew, you know that, uh, I'm not too crazy about those on-the-nose Christian films, do you feel like they rush to the light and, and the prophets skip the tunnel? You know the image of the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Well, the tunnel's too short, or the tunnel's uh, got holes in it, there's a lot of different things. Uh, and you can impact uh, that part of the story when you get to the light of the resolution. Uh, yeah, I guess just talking a little bit more about this idea of how, uh, as Christian artists, we work with and handle sin as a material Yeah, I, I, I think I mean I think uh, with anything, uh, it's being honest in how we how we portray it, and I, and I think uh, this doesn't matter whether you're a Christian writer or a secular writer, um, but you put you put something out there and you honestly follow. Well, what honestly happens? Um, oh, let me let me find. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to find it. Um, but uh, Dorothy Sayers says that there's. Um, there's no, no greater test of a theology. Oh, here it is. There's, there's no more searching test of a theology than submit it to dramatic handling. Nothing so glaringly exposes inconsistencies in a character, a story, or a philosophy as to put it on the stage and allow it to speak for itself. Which only, of course, works if you're, if you're being honest with it. Um, and that even goes back to treating it seriously, I think, is, is, is part of the, the way of saying it. Um, for example, the, the movie The War Room um, has... A, there's a lot of lovely things about the war room. Um, uh, I think the, uh, especially within the acting, um, but my problem with the war room is in the writing, and my problem with the war room is I don't think they treat prayer seriously. I don't think they're serious at all about prayer. Um, and, and what I mean by that, for those of you who have seen it, isn't that they don't revere prayer, it's that they did not test prayer. Um, they said prayer will solve your problems, and prayer does. They pray, and there are no problems. They don't go through the darkness to the other side of the problem. They don't, they don't they don't see what prayer uh, does through time. Instead, prayer is like, a, uh, is, is like the instant fix. So they kind of, they're, in my mind, they're lying about the power of prayer. And by lying about the power of prayer, in my mind, they're not taking it seriously. Um, I, I, I liked how you said, like, the tunnel too short. Um, what, what, what we, uh, <laughs> in, in the constant battle between Catholicism and Protestantism, uh, one of the battles is the, the overemphasis on, on uh, Good Friday in Catholicism uh, or the lack of emphasis on it uh, in Protestantism. And, and, and we, need, we need that blend. The fact of the matter is we don't go from the triumphant entry to the resurrection. We have to go through the week. 
uh, and all of that week encounters, you know, including Wednesday, including Thursday night, including Friday, including Saturday, the hopelessness of, of a world without Christ. We went, you know, we went, we had an entire day where hope was not in the world um, before, before the resurrection. And I think with all of our stories, anything that we're testing, whatever we're writing about, if we're going to write about sin, uh, if we're going to have a, a couple that's having an affair, we don't need to say this is bad. What we need to do is be honest about what does that do? What does that do to their relationship? What does that do to their lives? What does that do to them as human beings? What does that do? And if we see the, con if we go through the journey, that's, that's really, uh, I, I think, where, where we show the, the power of sin. It's never about saying, oh, don't do that. That's bad. Uh, it's about going. So if anybody, and you don't have to admit it in this room, we are being recorded. If there's anybody who's seen the 40-year-old virgin, um, there's secular writers who took the concept of virginity seriously. Um, and all the way through to testing it, and uh, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> when you get to the end of that movie, the 40-year-old virgin keeps his virginity until his wedding night. Um, and his, uh, that wedding night is both first the most disappointing thing in his life, uh, followed by the most glorious uh, thing that he could ever imagine. They took these people who were not going out and saying, you must stay a virgin, you must stay, there was no, uh, none of that in their view, because that's not their world view, but they said, well, let's look at it. Why do people do this? Why do people have purity rings? Let's look at it seriously. Let's see what are the consequences of it. And it, it, goes, through, it goes through the darkness. That, you know, Steve Carell's character does not have an easy ride getting to, getting to the end. He's tested very, very strongly. Um, so I think, I think that's how we talk seriously about sin. I think that's how, how we seriously talk about virtue. Yes, I think in the 20s, it was the ambition of every young man leaving university was to write the great American novel. Um, I think in the, in the 21st century is to make the great American film. And I think people are trying to do that. I'm enormously impressed by the work of my colleague Gil Oakley. Very imaginative, very challenging theatrical work. We should write a film then. What do you have? Um, <laughs> and it should be on Kierkegaard. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think that the, there are some good signs of hope. Not everybody likes Tyler Perry, but he boldly takes really difficult situations and some real suffering. He doesn't hesitate uh, to make an R-rated film if he chooses. That's the kind of reality, and he's good reality. And I think that we've seen in the last three years, and I'm writing about this now, quite a renaissance in uh, films that are truly challenging, some made by Christians and some not. You see, I don't think we necessarily find the truth in Jesus Christ by watching a Christian film. People find faith in all sorts of different ways, and may, maybe in secular films too. I have somebody who became a Christian after watching The Big Chill. Well, of course. Actually, I interviewed a person because I was doing a study on conversion experiences, and the conversion experiences started with The Big Chill, and also with Amadeus. I found, you know, and I only interviewed maybe 20 people or something like that, but I, all the way through, where did it begin, where did it end, go all the way, two or three hour interviews, and I was totally shocked. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar was the third one. So uh, of those 20, it was like three that their conversion experience started with film. And if you think about it, film puts you in a darkened room, it focuses your attention, and it could, if the film's good, ask profound questions. And all of these, all of these were not necessarily Christian films. I think the closest would be uh, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. But that's made by, what, Norman Jewison? Uh, I think he's Jewish, so he's not a Christian. It's written, it's written by two atheists. Two atheists. Okay. And I found three people that those were the films that started their conversion experience. And my question is, what the heck are we doing as Christians? Why do we have to make these other kinds? And I totally agree with, you know this, because we've talked before, of these other kinds of films. I don't even watch them, because the very first thing I think is they're too simplistic, and reality is thrown away. I don't relate to them, and I very, not many Christians relate to them. And, and some do, but certainly my non-Christian friends don't. And uh, they're, they're sentimental, and uh, their characters are, are usually one-dimensional. Right. I, I think one of the reasons that I love the theater so much is, one, you, you can go out and do an Elvgren play for $10,000 rather than $10 million. And that's encouraging to get your things done like that. But you walk out on the stage, and you go like this. And what's happening? It's raining, right? You do that on the film, 
and th they think it's a technical error. You know, we don't see the rain and things like that. So why am I in love with this and all of the great theatricalism that supports films? I mean, a stage, stage plays. Because the theater is finally getting around to uh, saying, well, what can we do on the stage that the film can't do? And that is to explore the world of symbolism, the world of imagery, the world of transformation magically in front that's not happening that we believe. It's, it's a, uh, a vital injection for the imagination. And so I'm thinking, well, how do we live? How many angels are in this room? We live on the edge of the ineffable. All the time, every time we sit down and pray, we're recognizing. Every time we look around on our spiritual tiptoes, we're saying, there's more than just this. And because we say that, then it can be trite, it can be thing, but what we're saying is that life is not literal. And I'm afraid that the body of Christ in so, so many ways is literal. And if we can get them thinking in terms of non-literalism, in terms of the phantasmagoria that the, the Bible itself gives us, then I think we'll see breakthroughs. Then I think we'll be able to create, create, you know, um, not just Robin Williams going to hell, which, by the way, was very fascinating yeah, in its own way, <laughs> but, but um, th we're, we're going to break open the minds of our, our things and say, oh, there's so many ways that we can project this, what we believe in. There's so many ways that we can toy with this being on the edge of God. dysfunctional people go to the Bible. In the very first family, one brother killed the other. You look at the, the, the 12 people that Jesus told, the 12 sons of the, uh, Joseph, uh, nine of them wanted to kill their brother. Tim called, talked them into just sending them into slavery. I mean, this is the people you're going to start the whole salvation of mankind on? And you go over and over again, and you see those kinds of, of problems, and you kind of begin to feel good a little bit about your family. And then, <laughs> but then also you begin to see how very real those characters are and how very phony most of our characters are. And I think that's what, what Andrew was saying. I totally agree with him on that. Let's take a couple questions because we're running out of time here from the audience. Uh, if you have any for anyone or all of them. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess this is probably more towards film and theater. But uh, because, how would, would there be any guidelines or, I don't know, comments on how do you portray sin without sinning yourself? The question is, how do you portray sin without sinning yourself? Well, I don't think that's too difficult. Uh, novelists throughout the, uh, the ages have been, managed to write uh, appalling situations about being part of themselves. Charles Dickens was one. Uh, the, the Old Testament is definitely an R-rated book. Uh, but film. Hmm? But on film, yes, yeah. I think film writers can do this. This is the art of the imagination. It's a gift of God, but I think a gift of everybody. The question is, you can be 
understand it, but, but be a part of it. Do you agree, Sean? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky question depending on what the sin is. Um, I think it's very easy to murder somebody on film without actually sinning. Because um, we're make-believe, we're pretending, we're taking on characters. Um, and, there, and there's a contract we have between the film and the audience, saying, you guys know we're actors, we're not really, this really isn't Bathsheba, this isn't really David, right? You know that, right? Um, now, where it gets tricky is, well, what about the sins that you are actually performing the sin? What about, uh, what about taking the Lord's name in vain? Uh, what about um, uh, certain acts of sexuality uh, where, oh, they're actually doing it. They're not just pretending that it's being done. There are two physical bodies in the same space kissing each other or whatever. Um, and and that, that's a, a much longer discussion. Um, I think everybody has different, different lines of, of where they're at and where they're crossing those lines. I don't think there is a solid uh, line. I, I do think that there is, hey, you're definitely, you're sitting, even though you're pretending you're somebody else. Um, but where, where, where on that line do you go? I don't know. Um, I think a lot of the team, uh, the, the problem that we're having now, which we did not have under the code, I think the code was a bad idea, except in terms of creativity. Uh, the code, the Hayes Code did great things for creativity. Some of the most creative things were written because they could not actually portray the sin. They had to be creative about how, how are you making it clear that these two are doing it. How are you making it clear that this is happening? How are you making it clear that he is swearing when he's not allowed to say any of the swear words? Um, and the creators were much more creative about it. I think the audience accepts that. I think uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica created its own language uh, in order to be able to swear on, on primetime TV. These days, people are saying, well, we don't, we, why don't we just swear? Um, they're being you know, less creative about it. So that's, I know it's not a full answer. We don't have time to really have a full answer. It is. Um, we have to deal with the areas of sin. The Bible deals with them all kinds of ways. In almost every instance, what does the Bible do? It shows the responsibility and the repercussions of sin. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, blink at portraying or talking about the sin. But there is a definite measure of responsibility. And I think that as an artist, if you can touch upon that, uh, Friends, the television show, doesn't touch upon it. We rarely see, uh, you know, everybody's jumping in bed with everybody else and they shrug it off every week. That's not how sin works. Uh, it's a long-term thing. That's not how it works psychologically. That's not how it works in reality. Does that mean we don't do it? We don't, we don't, yeah, it means we don't do it. But it doesn't mean we don't write about it. If we're conscious of what it is, where it's going, and the damage it can do. I see uh, Roger uh, Shaker here. And one of the wonderful things about Indian cinema, which I'm mean, just introduced to, is that they have very good conventions. They're going to bed, they, they walk behind a bush. That's all we need to show. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the movie, if anybody's seen any of the Avenger movies, you're not going to hear the F-bomb dropped in an Avengers movie. They actually address that and explain why in the in Age of Ultron. One of the characters does a, says a mild oath, and uh, Captain America out of instinct says language, <laughs> making it very clear that you don't use swear words around Captain America. They make a big joke about it, um, and they but they just communicate to the audience, look, we're not going to go there. We don't need to go there. So there, there, there are ways around it. There are lots of ways, but probably none that will give me an instant quick answer. Oh, I wasn't looking for um, one more question. We have time for one more. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was thinking in, in the Bible where it says that, that Paul might have planted the seed in someone. Apollos watered it. We believe that the Holy Spirit brings it to fruition. As film or art in general relates to evangelism or that process, can it fit into that process and where in that process would it lie? And there also may not be a solid answer for, you know, any kind of art. I, I think Ben already answered that in a way of all of these people who were converted whose the seed was planted by a film. Um, we're definitely in the planting business at, at the very least. At the very least. I think films that try to do it all in one shot are missing the boat. They're pretty, occasionally, it can happen, like a Jesus film maybe, because that's a, most of the time that's successful in countries that have never heard the story at all. But in countries like we have, what we're in, where we're so prone to be bombarded with, with persuasive messages all the time, we have our antennas up for them, 
and then we're going to come in and tell everybody this whole thing all at once. It just sounds like an infomercial, and we're not going there. And I just tune out, and most people do. So maybe just, I think, be much more serious, more depth, take it seriously, um, and maybe don't try to do, there's a wonderful little book called, by Greg Beekner, if you've heard of him, um, called Telling the Truth. The Gospel is Fantasy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale. And essentially what he says is the process of, of uh, knowing God is three stages. That it's, uh, I'm sorry, tragedy, comedy, and fairy tale. The very first is tragedy. If, if, if you don't know something's wrong, and somebody comes, I got a, you know, I got a pill to fix to help you with, or I got something to give you that will help you with that. Well, I don't need that. So you have to, you have to understand. And sometimes, and that's why I would argue, you know, Country for All Men is a very powerful movie. Not for everyone, granted. Not a Christian movie. Cormac McCarthy, who wrote that book, uh, is from a Catholic background, but I don't know that he's a believer. But it is, prof you cannot, you, I, I challenge you. I won't say you, have, you should watch it, maybe you should, but no one who has watched that film can walk away and say, huh, oh, great, great country. <laughs> They're going to walk away and say, there's something profoundly wrong with that country. And it makes things that you and I sort of accept and read the paper every day and watch on our television, it kind of puts it in your face and say, what are you thinking? There's craziness happening here in exaggerated ways, as Leonard Connor say, doing the big picture thing and the, and the shouting. But so she wake for so that film itself doesn't do the whole thing, but it wakes us up to the fact that we need there's a tragedy there. Something needs to be done. So I think film could maybe even play it, it, it plants a seed, but it could even move us in other areas. But it can't do all. It really can't. By the way, this is a blatant propaganda thing. Uh, Sean, Sean wrote this wonderful film that we're gonna. When's it coming out? I don't know. I think, I think they're going to start screenings in May, maybe? And, and I, uh, it's comedy, and it's, it deals with religious people in religious situations, and it's not all the way we would like it to go, but it is, makes a huge step in that way, and it, it, it looks at it in, in, in a comic way, and it, it's, it's very wonderful. It, let, it, it does something that very few Christian films, it laughs at us. Instead of laughing at the world, we laugh at ourselves and our own stupidity. And I see scripture doing that too. All right, our time is up. I want to thank you for that. If you like this and you want more of these kinds of things, email the dean. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the kind of stuff that I like. We will have one more uh, meeting and we'll let, get, it, get back. Did you uh, send Yeah, so pass those out. out. Okay, and we'll try to get those people here or somebody here to mm -hmm. be part of that. Uh, in a few weeks, and we'll just uh, watch the Bolton Boys work. God bless you.